Yeah, um, when I started at, at the company, um, there wasn't a lot of experience with anything to do with maritime operations. Uh, pretty much uh, when I started, it was it was David, and that was it. Um, they made Scott Scott Griffith was my boss. Um, he came from the construction industry. It was very clear that he had no maritime experience. He had never operated on the oceans, um, outside of some recreational stuff, um, and he had never worked in uh, the marine in industry. Um, and then. Uh, the other operations technician at the time was Ryan, um, uh, Ryan uh, Stockfleet, and uh, he had not come from a maritime background at all. Um, so initially learning some of the, the ways that they were operating and the things that they were doing um, was of concern to me. And I had I had some concerns and 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 uh, regarding you know whether how we're towing the Lars operation, um, things like that. Um, and, uh, and then that ended up developing over time. There was a lot of safety conversations when the, the, uh, the first Cyclops II or, uh, the, the first Titan hole arrived. Um, that was a constant conversation amongst most everybody, almost every day. And what were those, some of those conversations? So, um, conversation being one was the, the size. Um, and then, uh, as I think it's been attested to before, you know, the ends of it, as, as you, you looked in it, it didn't look like a, a very quality layup. Um, there was a lot of conversations over how it was going to be tested. Um, and I think that that came to um, that it was going to be, Stockton was going to take it down himself. Um, and it was interesting. It, it went really quickly from, oh, they had considered uh, testing it out in Maryland at the, uh, the uh, ocean test facility there. Um, but that with the cost would be prohibit would be too expensive essentially, and uh, so that Stockton would just uh, take it down and dive it. Um, anytime that you know the idea of saying, well, why can't we just you know essentially put it on a cable and, and pull it down to the ocean floor if you want to test it on man, then that's a whole lot probably cheaper. Um, you know, they just wasn't wouldn't even be open to conversation about that, um, and so there was a lot of. Um, just concern overall, I think. Um, the engineering department didn't seem overly qualified. Um, so that was a concern for, they seem to be handling all the design, especially once I kind of found out that the University of Washington really wasn't involved anymore, uh, and nor was Boeing. So you're looking for who, who is the, the qualified individual that's making these decisions. Um, and uh, it was really, you know, the, the engineering staff over there was Tony Nissen and then what I think they had one or two other full-time folks, um, and, but everybody else was basically college interns during that summer while I was there. Um, so it was pretty concerning over the qualifications for what they were attempting to do with uh, that submarine. Thank you, that's all I had, Mr. Nimmer. Uh, sir, Com Lieutenant Commander Whalen has a question. Thank you, sir. Did you ever have any discussions uh, with Mr. Rush or anybody at Ocean Gate regarding a retired Rear Admiral Lockwood while you were there? Yeah, so it came up at one point, I don't remember exactly when, um, that, so I learned that he was on the, uh, the board, uh, and I don't remember where I, I had learned that, um, but there was a conversation, I don't remember if it was in passing it specifically, but I think that um, Stockton was just trying to, um, uh, basically, it came up in conversation that they had been sharing information about the, de the development and the design with the board, um, and I think that it was one of those conversations of trying to uh, calm nerves and to say that, you know, Admiral Lockwood had, you know, they had done a brief and, you know, he'd even commented uh, feedback on that the, he was concerned over the, the Lars design with having those uh, air tanks exposed and towing it in the, the in North Atlantic. Um, but that was about all I had for conversation regarding Admiral Lockwood. Um, and so that was uh, from, you know, in conversation with Stockton. I don't remember when that was, but that was the one thing that stood out about that. But I didn't know much about Admiral Lockwood. Thank you. So I'd like to go to the, the climate uh, work climate at Ocean Gate during the time you were there. Uh, 
were the senior personnel uh, open to receiving feedback? It, it is interesting that you had meetings with uh, your supervisor and the CEO of the company. Yeah, so uh, Stockton was in and out a lot. He didn't, um, uh, my interactions with him directly, um, he seemed uh, just, well, I, he, he, he seemed to be very defensive whenever anybody asked questions that were pointed. Um, but other than that, um, so uh, Neil McCurdy and Scott Griffith were both very easy to talk to. Um, they would listen. Uh, but I feel like that there was a lot of uh, just uh, almost mouthpiecing for Stockton and for what he was trying to accomplish. Um, and so the, the one person that really took things serious was David Lockridge. Um, you know, and it became very apparent that he was unhappy with the interactions going on. I know that he had no faith in uh, the engineering department there, especially Tony. Um, and the... Uh, you know, there were concerns. Uh, he started kind of filling me in, uh, David Lockridge did, about uh, how things went as I was, as we were talking about when, once the, uh, the Cyclops 2 arrived, uh, or the, 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 the Titan Hole 1 um, arrived, and we were having these conversations over the hull, and the, the viewport concerns were, were mentioned uh, at the time, and they were trying to, um, you know, um, and then we also had, um, the two contractors that were that worked there, uh, Chris Himes and um, Tim, I can't remember Tim's last name all of a sudden, but uh, they were both uh, subcontractors for the company, so they would come in and out over over that summer while I was there. And just talking to them, they had a lot of uh, submersible experience, so they had a lot of questions that didn't seem to be getting answered as well um, regarding the design, the build, um, and, and what was occurring and how that was pr proceeding forward. So, um, and then the, um, I, I started hearing some stories about Stockton's temper, um, that, uh, David had shared with me the story of the Andrea Doria dive and them getting stuck and the, uh, um, having to get out of that situation. Um, and Stockton's kind of, um, his temper towards, uh, David having to take over, um, and uh, that, that was also very concerning that he may have not have had the, the temperament to be doing this kind of work. Did anyone else ever have concerns voiced to you about uh, Mr. Rush's temper? Not that I can remember. I mean, the only people that were really there at the time while I was there on the operations side were Scott Griffith, Ryan Stockfleet, myself, um, David, and then uh, I think uh, there was an intern she came through for a little while, Michaela Monroe or something like that. Um, and then uh, there was a, they hired on somebody right before I left. And so, but other than that, they were very. Uh, was the conversation at lunch a heated discussion? It became very tense. Um, I felt very uncomfortable. Um, initially just kind of laying it out, uh, what, what my concerns were. Um, I thought he'd be a little bit more receptive to it. Um, and uh, it was very quickly, you know, you, you could see the, the avoidance of, of, of we're, not, we're not taking pastors for hire kind of thing. And then as he shifted over to, um, to well, we're going to flag it outside the U.S., <clears throat> became a pretty tense conversation. Did you clearly explain your background in the Coast Guard to Mr. Rush? Um, I, I think I had explained to him that I'd been a boarding officer in the Coast Guard and that, you know, my understanding and, and experience with, you know, vessels, you know, for pastures for hire and that, you know, I initially, when I started with the company too, I wasn't aware that submersibles didn't have a uh, uh, six passenger exemption <clears throat> for un uninspected so that was later um and then uh excuse me the uh um um yeah so i you know that that, that specific information i found out while i was working there but I, I i explained it to him he didn't seem to to care um 
And sir, before I go to the NTSB, we've, we've been going for about 45 minutes. Would you just like to take a, a break? No, I'm okay. I'm just okay. All right, um, Mr. Muse. Uh, thank you for your testimony, Mr. Coy. I have no questions, Mr. Chair. Uh, Commander Willen. Mr. McCoy, do you believe that Mr. Rush understood the regulations as they were in place at that time? I absolutely do. Do you know what a professional engineer is? Yes. And what is a professional engineer? <clears throat> so a professional engineer is uh, a person who has basically uh, they have to have a degree in their specialty field, and then they work uh, in, in the state of Washington. I believe it's a five-year uh, program that they have to work under another professional engineer. And they have to meet a, a set of milestones. Um, and uh, basically, at that time, then they become licensed as a professional engineer in that state that they are operating in. And at the time that you were employed with OceanGate, was there a professional engineer that you were aware of on staff? I don't believe so. And in your employment now, you, and I believe you work for a shipbuilding company. I do. Do they have a uh, safety first policy or any type of um, employee safety policy? They do. And in the policy that you work with now, if you were to bring up a safety concern, how, what's the process for bringing up a safety concern? Um, <clears throat> so they have, a, they, they have a director of safety um, or a, a, a safety manager at the company that oversees the entirety of the safety program. And then there's an entire safety department involved in that process. Um, and then there's also through, uh, and the safety manager answers directly to the CEO of the company. Um, so there's not any of the other directors or vice presidents are in that chain. Um, and then uh, any complaints that are brought up or concerns are, are basically, um, are brought up and forwarded to that department and then investigated by that department who acts independently from the rest of the shipyard. And was that sim similar to the same process as when you were with OceanGate? Um, no, it was, uh, there was no formal uh, kind of a, a, a outside of your normal chain um, safety process. It was basically you, you would bring up your concerns directly to your supervisor and they would work their way up and they were always adjudicated somewhere up uh, between your, whoever your director was and Stockton. Was there a safety officer at Ocean Gate that you were aware of? No. Thank you. Mr. Fawcett. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Did you retain copies of any emails between yourself and Ocean Gate related to your safety concerns? I do not have any emails retained from 2017, no. And then uh, did you did you hear or see any communication regarding documenting or state registering the Titan? No, I think I had brought, I had asked about that because they did have Washington numbers on for the uh, Antipodes and for Cyclops One, so they had WN numbers for those two. So those were clearly and um, you know U.S. flag vessels. Uh, I believe I asked if that was the plan, and I think that the answer was just no. And then it wasn't until lunch that they talked about uh, with Stockton where he talked about flagging it in the Bahamas. That was the first time I'd heard that. So, so as a Coast Guard boarding officer, if you saw a vessel uh, that didn't have registration numbers in navigable waters of the United States, what action would you take? Um, <clears throat> well, uh, so they would not be allowed to operate. Uh, there would definitely be, you're, at a minimum, it's gonna be a citation. Um, written, uh, you're gonna, being that they're not allowed to operate in U.S. waters, you're not gonna allow them to continue their, their, uh, their trip, so they're gonna have to uh, head home uh, and be terminated, and it would most likely be a, a citation, um, and then uh, it would be entered into missile and, and tracked from there if they attempted to, I guess, try to operate further. And that's the Coast Guard's database we've talked about here at great length. Correct, yes. The, Marine information for safety and law enforcement, I believe. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Uh, Mr. McCoy, during your time, your entire time in the Coast Guard, uh, have you ever encountered a vessel that did not have a 
either a U.S. document, U.S. flag, or a state registration <clears throat> underway? I, I had a, uh, uh, I did a boarding on a, a vessel, it was a sailboat that had, um, it had conflicting information regarding, so it had been U.S. documented, um, but the documentation had never been apparently transferred over to the new owner. Um, so the, the, the bill of sale and all the information that said who the ownership was. So essentially at that point in time, I believe it was considered to be, we considered it to be a undocumented vessel being that it had not been transferred over and, uh, he was cited for, uh, for that. And just to clarify, that would be an expired, uh, registration or documentation. Correct. Yes. Yeah. So it had, it was a previously documented vessel at that point in time, the, the, the certificate of, sorry, the, yes, the certificate. To t certificate of documentation was was no longer valid. Are you aware of how the Coast Guard tracks recreational and commercial vessels in the missile database? Um, yes, in the terms if uh, if you're referring to so by vessel name, you can search by VIN number, and you could also search it by their state or their documentation number. And by VIN, you mean vessel identification number? Correct. Yes. And that would be the Coast Guard documentation number if federally read, documented? Correct, yes. From your experience, would it be hard to track a vessel in our database that was not registered or documented? It would. Um, it would probably need, a, uh, you would probably need some amplifying information in there. Um, I would assume if it's gonna be flagged in, in any country or any state, uh, I believe it's common though that they would have to have affixed a VIN number to it or a vessel identification number um, to it. So if uh, otherwise it would just be, you know, if there's no VIN number, then it, that I would assume as a boarding officer that it's not flagged or documented.